626-6799. And the meeting ID tonight is 973-914, I'm sorry, 9104-7757. Again, that's 973-914-7757. Five, seven. When you call in, you'll be placed in a virtual waiting room. And again, public comment will be at the end of the meeting and each person will get three minutes of, of time for public comment. Um, let's go ahead and do our roll call for attendance. And please remember after stating that you're here to state where, where you're coming in from. Um, so Madam Clerk, if you could. Commissioner Blood. Present here in Battle Creek, Michigan. Vice Mayor Ferris. Present. Tuning in from Battle Creek, Michigan. Commissioner Herring. Commissioner Lance. Present from Battle Creek, Michigan. Mayor Banky. Commissioner Morris. Present from Battle Creek, Michigan. Commissioner Reynolds. Commissioner Sophia. Present in Battle Creek, Michigan. And Commissioner Zenda Wilson. Present remotely from Battle Creek, Michigan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I just wanna let folks know, Mayor Benke will be joining us just a little bit later in the meeting. So without further ado, I'll hand stuff over to Mallory Avis who will present for us the transit master plan. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Ted. Yeah, Vice Mayor, I'll get us started real quick, um, if that's okay, before I turn it over to Mallory. I did want to just point out quickly, too, we did hear from Commissioner Herring that uh, I, I think she's planning on joining us, but she's going to be off camera. So I just wanted to share that information, too. And uh, yeah, and quickly, before I turn it over to Mallory, too, I, I think some commissioners may, re may remember, I know others are new to this process, we actually started the master planning process for transit uh, actually back in 2017. And most of the heavy lifting for that project was actually done in 2018. And just as we were preparing to adopt that plan, uh, we pivoted slightly in transit, recognizing that we needed to go in a different direction uh, in order to support the implementation of the plan. And we were very fortunate in 2019 to have Mallory Avis uh, join our team uh, and then once again, just as we were hoping for adoption, uh, the pandemic hit in early 2020. So we've, we've been a little bit delayed with this project. Uh, we know there are some excellent recommendations uh, in the plan. Uh, Mallory will discuss those in a minute here. And I know her team has been using it as a guide uh, for planning and transit. So despite the fact that there is a lot going on around transit, even countywide, um, we think the timing's right for a formal adoption at this point. Uh, and that's what we're going to ultimately look for from the commission at the next meeting on the 15th. So let me turn it over to Mallory. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Vice Mayor Ferris and commissioners. I'm going to share my screen. And hope that that worked. All right. Everybody can see that okay? All right. As Ted mentioned, our transit master plan was created by a consulting group in 2018 uh, called Foursquare Integrated Transportation Planning. And the goals of that transit master plan were to identify what our existing strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats were, and then recommend some service improvements. So in order to identify where we need to go, first they gave us kind of an example of where we're at. So they reviewed some travel patterns, they assessed our efficiency, and then of course identified what the unmet needs in our community are. And then as part of their recommendation, they gave us ideas on how we can serve our existing riders better, how we can attract new riders, and then how we can improve the overall system productivity and reliability. That master plan was guided by these following principles. And kind of the one umbrella principle is that service should be simple. In order for people to use transit, the service should be designed so that it's easy, it's easy to understand, and it's intuitive. 
It should operate at regular intervals and along direct paths. So it should be in simple patterns that people can remember and um, at regular times. And then it should operate along direct paths so that uh, it makes as few directional changes as possible. The route should also be symmetrical. So, so to the extent possible, the route should go inbound the same way it went outbound. And it makes riders um, able to navigate and understand where they came from so they know how to get back there. And then routes should serve well-defined markets. So there should be anchors such as grocery stores, education centers, major places of employment that kind of mark what those routes are and what they serve um, and be a mix of origins and destinations. And then lastly, the service should be well coordinated. This means your transfers should be easy and to the greatest extent possible, it should minimize those connection times for people to wait in between their routes. So Battle Creek Transit's existing conditions are uh, that we currently operate fixed route and teletransit. For the sake of this, we are not going to discuss BC Go or any of our pilot operations that we have going on because those weren't around when we did the master plan and those are exactly what they said as a pilot. So the fixed route service, we have eight fixed routes that serve not only the city of Battle Creek, but also the city of Springfield, Bedford Township, Emmett Township, and Penfield Township. And those routes operate Monday through Friday, 515 to 645, and then Saturday, 915 to 445. Those are on 30 and 60 minute frequencies, depending on the routes, and fares range from 60 cents to $1.25. Our teletransit service is demand response. That means it's door to door. So it takes you direct between your origin and your destination. And that serves a larger area. So that is a, a much larger service area than our existing fixed route service. That operates the same hours with extended service during the weekdays that goes until midnight. This is a pre-scheduled service though. So within a 15 minute window of your appointment time, you have to call and schedule a ride. Say you have a doctor's appointment at two o'clock. We'll pick you up at your door, take you to your doctor's appointment and get you there within that 15 minute window of what you've scheduled. The fares range from $5 to $7 for the general public, depending on the time of day and $2 for seniors and reduced fare. Now this teletransit service also operates our mandated ADA complementary paratransit service, which is required during the same hours that we operate fixed route. So when we go back to what those guiding principles were and we apply it to what our existing conditions are, we both pass and fail. So the areas that we currently are excelling at is that our service should operate at regular intervals and be well coordinated. All of our routes are 30 or 60 minute routes. So they coordinate back at our transfer center either 15 or 45 minutes after the hour. And they all operate on the same schedule Monday through Friday, no, Monday through Saturday, um, regardless of what time of day it is. The only difference here is the VA Express that operates 30 minute frequency um, during specific times of the day. One area that we need improvement is when we apply that thought that routes should operate along a direct path. You can see in this image that our routes are currently very circuitous. So they take multiple turns and travel in multiple directions. And it can be very disorienting for a passenger to see where they're at along their route. Same thing with the symmetry of the route. So our route does not necessarily take that same uh, direction of travel back to the transfer center that it took out of the transfer center. Again, this can be disorienting for the passengers and make it difficult for people to know where and when to get off or where and when to get on. And then we both kind of pass and fail when we think about the routes should serve well-defined markets. When we think about where we do serve, we have this huge list of places that sound great, um, and these are key anchor points throughout the city, but we're also missing several places outside of Battle Creek. So there's places, um, apartment complex in Springfield and Penfield that we're missing, um, large areas of employment, even in the industrial park that we're not currently serving. And so those were identified as areas of improvement, even though we are serving this huge list of uh, key anchors. When we think about our stakeholders, we think about the people who are currently using our service. 
the consultants did a great job of surveying our existing writers and found that most of our writers rely heavily on our existing bus service. So 57% of our writers use our service almost every day and 47% of them do not own a personal vehicle. Most of our writers are economically disadvantaged with 91% of our passengers having households that earn less than $35,000 a year. Most of these trips that writers are making are between their homes and their place of employment. We also have a large number of discretionary trips, which is shopping, medical, personal trips. And of course, as I'm sure you've all heard, there's a strong support for increased evening and weekend service. When we consider what the demographics of our, our riders are, we see that most of our riders are employed, whether it's part-time or full-time, the majority of our passengers are, are using transportation to get to work. We have a pretty even mix of male and female passengers, and the majority of our passengers are making $25,000 a year or less. When we look at our age breakdown, we have a pretty large demographic there that's 36 to 64. But uh, interestingly enough, we have a, a large portion of our passengers that are 26 to 35. When we ask them how often they use public transportation, I think, in my opinion, the, the most intriguing fact was that zero people responded that this was their first time using public transportation. The majority of our passengers use transportation almost every day or several times per week. When they were asked why they use public transportation, the most popular responses were because they don't own a car or because taking the bus is cheaper than gas or car maintenance. Ultimately, when we asked where they were going or how they were going to get there, I'm sorry, when we asked them how they were going to get there if they didn't have public transportation, the majority of respondents said that they would either walk or get a ride slash carpool. One thing that I'd like to point out is 12% of respondents said that they would use taxi or Uber and 16% said that they wouldn't have made the trip otherwise. <clears throat> When we consider the preferences of our riders, um, between two different scenarios, we, they ranked what their preference was. So between more frequent bus service or longer service hours, passengers far preferred longer service hours. So that would be rather than changing from 60 minutes, every 60 minutes a bus comes, it's changing it to service running later at night. Same thing for weekend service versus more weekday service. And passengers preferred more bus stops with shorter walking distance than fewer bus stops. So rather than seeing something like an express route through Battle Creek, they would rather see more bus stops with fewer uh, distance between. When we look at buses running more frequently, but on fewer streets, they preferred that over running on more streets, but less frequently. So that kind of contradicts that frequency, but so rather than going on some of those circuitous routes we were talking about, focusing on our main streets and providing more frequent service was the preference. And then serving new areas rather than improving the existing service. So we already spoke to the need of serving some of those areas that we identified we're not meeting outside of the city of Battle Creek. And then the survey also allowed for open-ended questions and comments. The most frequent comment was that people would like to see increased service span. Again, that's not days of the week, that's more hours of the day. And so people would like to see longer hours of service with the second most common response being adding Sunday service. So we look back at what those guiding principles are and we both pass and fail when we apply that, that uh, guiding principle to our existing service. We know that we operate along regular interval at regular intervals, but we don't operate along direct paths and we're not symmetrical. We have a mix of defined markets that we're currently serving, but at least our routes are well coordinated. So out of that analysis, the consultants provided uh, two different scenarios as opportunities for improvement. The first scenario you'll see adds a route, 6W. 
It also changes all of our existing routes to one hour frequencies. The orange route on the left hand side of that first map is a connector throughout the VA in Springfield that provides connections outside of the downtown transfer center. And it requires an, not only an additional vehicle, but two additional staff. Service scenario two on the right does not change, uh, is neutral. It doesn't require additional uh, staff, it doesn't require additional vehicles, but it does change some of the route frequency and identifies areas where there could be directional changes to travel that allows both bi-directional travel um, that eliminates some of that circuitry and creates symmetry along the route. Both of these routes will stream side, streamline the service. It'll minimize that one-way service that we were talking about. We'll also hit some of those large multifamily housing communities. One of the things that we've already changed is uh, our service to Walmart and Meyer on our Southwest Capital route. And so we're already providing consistent service to there, but that was also a frequent comment throughout the study. Scenario one is expanded coverage, but again, it comes at a cost with two additional staff and one additional vehicle, whereas scenario two is cost neutral. The threats to implementation here are essentially three major things. The jurisdictional boundaries. Um, our service operates outside of just the city of Battle Creek and requires us servicing many of those key anchors and destinations that are in Springfield, Bedford, Penfield, and Emmett. We also have infrastructure challenges. So you can see um, we are lacking sidewalks and crosswalks. Sometimes it's just the roadway condition and sometimes it's the bus stop. So uh, right now there's several stops that are um, not accessible via wheelchair or mobility device. We also have roadways that have bus stops without pedestrian access, such as sidewalks or crosswalks. And uh, some of the roadways that we're traveling down are very residential and aren't necessarily designed for buses. So the infrastructure throughout the city and the surrounding communities are also a threat to implementation of either scenario. And then perhaps the largest threat is just the overall access to resources. The majority of our funding comes through grants, whether it be state or federal. We also have a small portion of our funding that comes from passenger fares. And then of course, our funding partners and community support. The chart on the right breaks down essentially our funding um, by source, with the majority of our funding coming from state and federal budgets. And so ultimately, the state and federal budget, along with the city budget, uh, directly impact our ability to provide the existing level of service, as well as any of the recommended scenarios. Overall, the consultants presented or recommended scenario two with some minor changes. So scenario two would be the easiest to implement. It doesn't have any major changes and allows us to implement um, or introduce elements of that first scenario as those resources become available. Scenario two is the scenario that provides bi-directional travel, still extends some routes and still provides additional service without requiring any additional staff or any additional vehicles. Overall, the, the term, long term goal would be to increase the frequency and that span of service. So extending that service into uh, later hours of the weekdays, adding Sunday service, and then considering 30 minute frequency during peak travel times. In addition to those scenarios, the consultants also recommended some additional um, changes and improvements to the BCT system. One of those is bus stop upgrades. So with either of those scenarios, many of our bus stops would need to be upgraded, not only to become ADA compliant, but to improve pedestrian and passenger access. And then it's estimated about 154 bus stops would need to be added or relocated and brought into ADA compliance. I always use this example, the passenger shelter that you see on the left picture is, um, 
does not have ADA accessibility, doesn't meet our current requirements for ADA. So there's no sidewalk connection from, this is uh, near the corner of Columbia and Riverside. There's no sidewalk connection for a passenger who may be walking um, to this bus stop to be able to get into the bus shelter, uh, especially if they're using any kind of mo mobility device. The picture on the right shows a passenger shelter just up ahead from where the bus is, but there's no sidewalk adjacent to it and there's no crosswalk for passengers to be able to safely get to and from the bus stop. There's also uh, at least six bus shelter relocations with additional um, identified throughout the plan. These would need to be uh, brought up to current ADA standards and bus shelters should be placed on both sides of the street and along areas that make sense where passengers are waiting at some of those key anchor points. So this is an example of a Capitol Ave Southwest at Family Fair. This is one area where the bus travels inbound and outbound the same direction. So a passenger may get off um, on the right side of the street there as the bus is headed outbound and attempt to cross Capitol to get to Family Fair so they could do their quick shopping and catch the bus at that shelter as it's coming back inbound. So it's just an example of one of those eight, uh, bus shelter relocations that we would need to consider. Some of the easier things that we've already been working through are basic marketing improvements, such as updating our system map. So the existing Battle Creek Transit map is the image on the left, the red and black image, that doesn't truly identify what routes, what directions of travel, where bus stops are located along there. Um, and it can be very difficult for passengers to be able to identify how to use the system. A great example of a, a route map is on the right, where routes are identified by color or number or letter. And then there are key points such as either major shopping locations, transfer locations, or directional information, as well as where routes intersect so that you can get from one route to another. Our passenger schedules. Um, on the left is an example of our existing passenger schedule that doesn't provide a to scale map or um, information about cross streets or bus stops along that route. So the timetable that we show on the left shows essentially only major points. Um, and on the map on the right doesn't necessarily provide a true scale version of where those stops are located. So if you're not familiar with our area and you're using those passenger schedules to navigate the system, you may struggle. A great example again is on the right where I believe this is Kalamazoo. They have not only direction of travel, but major locations and then have those locations labeled on their map that correlate with that timetable on the right. One of the major changes uh, that is both easy and difficult to make is changing the route naming convention. So right now we have route 1W and 2E and these uh, number and letter combinations don't necessarily indicate a direction of travel or what area you're headed to. So some people will call it the West Michigan route and some people will call it 1W. Some people will call it route five and some people will call it Fort Custer. So either choosing one or the other, naming it uh, a letter and a number, but not confusing people with a direction of travel. So when we consider that service scenario that was suggested, we would then have Route 1A and 1B, depending on which direction it was traveling at that time. Then Route 2, 3, 4, 5, and then 6, 7, and 8. At one half hour, it goes clockwise. The other half hour, it goes counterclockwise and the A and B would identify which direction of travel it was going. Our bus stop signage. Um, this is the, my, kind of my favorite story to tell of when I first moved here to Battle Creek and I am not a 269 area code. So when I called to get information, not only did I need to guess at what that first number in the phone number is there, 966 Bolt 474, um, but it didn't indicate to me what the area code was. So I got a completely different um, phone than BCT Transit. 
It also doesn't tell me what route is stopping there. It doesn't tell me what time it stops there. And it doesn't tell me who I'm looking for. Some good examples, these are here in Michigan, are the st uh, bus stop signs you see to the right. So from beta, it tells you at least what route is stopping there or what stop number it is on those colored routes. And then uh, the rapid in Grand Rapids on each of their stops has a schedule that this is the route that stops here, this is what time of day and what day of the week. One of the biggest recommendations was technology deployment. And this is something we hear from our passengers and from commissioners that uh, technology can help boost our ridership, but it can also help make traveling easier for our existing riders. So there are several apps that will help passengers navigate their travel. It'll help them plan their trips and it'll also allow them to purchase passes on their phones. These are all things that we're currently investigating and, and figuring out how to deploy here at Battle Creek but this will help passengers identify when their bus is coming and what bus they're looking for. One of the last recommendations considered what our operating budget looked like. And as I mentioned before, our resources depend on not only city, state, and federal budget, but our passenger fares as well. So the consultants provided three separate scenarios for what a fare increase would look like. Scenario one is no change to the existing fare, which is $1.25. Scenario two took that uh, fare increase to $1.50, so a 25 cent increase. And then scenario three was a more moderate increase that took it 50 cents to $1.75 and increased it by a dollar for teletransit uh, reduced fare service. When we look at the impact that that had on the budget deficit, implementing scenario two decreased that deficit by 1.4% and scenario three, the $1.75, decreased that budget deficit by nearly 4%. Now this was a proposal we had made last year and then um, due to COVID, we had discontinued fair collection and now we're ready to resume those conversations again. Lastly, the recommendations uh, also discussed our capital needs. And those capital needs, um, we've been lucky enough to be able to identify and uh, receive some grant awards that will help us replace things like our uh, bus shelters and will help us replace 70% of our fleet over the next several years. And so although those are still key things that need to be addressed in our long range plan, Right now, our current need for those has been addressed. At this time, I have nothing else and I will open it up to the commission and the public. Thank you, Mallory. We'll go ahead and uh, move on to the commission discussion. Before we do so, though, I'd like to just repeat for the public, if you'd like to call in for public comment, that will be in just a moment. The phone number is 312-626-6799, and it'll ask for a meeting ID, which is 973-9104. 7757. And um, we did have the mayor join us and Commissioner Herring has joined us. So um, before we get done with discussion, just at some point so that it's on the record, if you could let us know where you're tuning in from tonight. I'm Mark Bainke, president of um, Battle Creek, Michigan, downtown Battle Creek. Commissioner Wanika Herring here live from downtown Battle Creek. Thank you both. So we'll just, um, it is a workshop, so it's a little bit less formal than normal. So if anyone has questions for Mallory Avis or any comments regarding this plan, please feel free to go ahead and ask. Hey Mallory, how about the first proposal on the fare increase? What does that generate um, annually? And what percent does it reduce the budget deficit? Um, so the first proposal reduced the budget deficit less than 2% uh, and, and was estimated to generate less than $100,000 per year. 
the second proposal was roughly $140,000 per year um, and was almost 4%. Which one would you recommend? Uh, I had previously recommended and would recommend again scenario two that increased the fare to $1.75. Okay, thanks, Mallory. You're welcome. Thanks, Mallory, for the great presentation. Um, to kind of uh, use uh, Mayor Binky's as a platform into my question, how long has it been since we had a rate increase here in our city of Battle Creek? That's a very great question. So it has been since 2003 that our, our regular fixed route and teletransit have seen a fare increase. It's been since 2002 that there's been an increase to reduced fare rates. Okay, and when you, I, I know throughout our presentation, you had shown us um, several other municipalities, photos and things that they were up to. So when you compare um, like munici municipalities, those that have comparable demographics to us, how do we compare in regards to rates? Right now, we're on the lower end um, of the majority of those. And the majority of those systems are between $1.50 and $2. So our, our average there is about $1.75. And raising our fare to $1.75 would keep us in line with those other agencies. OK, but that's not the one you would recommend to start with. You would recommend going to $1.50 to start. Did I hear that correct? No, I would recommend going to $1.75 and okay. increasing the reduced fare by a dollar. Okay, fantastic. Well, this this sounds great. Um, I know that I've looked over this transit plan a couple times and um, we've gone over it. And um, there are some lofty goals in here and I think it's great and you're working on funding. Um, but I know that sometimes getting to that implementation part may uh, look a little different. So can you talk a little bit how to get from point A to B and what that might look with the short term long term and how might that look for us as a city? Absolutely. So I think the first thing to remember is that adoption doesn't necessarily mean implementation and implementation may look different than exactly what's laid out in this master plan. So while the, the basis of everything here is solid and we still agree with the direction that the consultants have pointed us in, the order that we implement things or the way that we implement things may be different and may look different by the time we get there. So this isn't an overnight change. Um, even if the commission adopted this and said, yes, go forth and do good, um, it's still gonna take us several years to get through a lot of these changes. And so by the time we get there, technology may be different or the goals and long-term plans for the system may be different. So overall, the plan is still the same and, and those changes still need to be made. It's just what they exactly look like may not be what's exactly in the plan. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate it. And again, thank you for um, the great presentation. Thank you. Everyone's quiet tonight. <laughs> I guess um, my question would be to Mallory, um, what is the potential of increasing ridership? Um, we haven't seen a drastic increase in ridership. Do you think some of these things will be an opportunity to see the ridership increase? Um, are there any predictions on that? So the master plan did estimate um, a 12% increase in ridership if we made these changes. I think COVID aside, if we made our system easier to use, easier to understand, and easier to pay for, as well as being more appealing, um, you know, offering amenities, having newer vehicles, and having passenger shelters that, um, you know, people are, that are well taken care of and that people are proud to have in front of their businesses, all of that definitely helps attract riders. So it's not just attracting those riders, it's also retaining those riders. So there's even kind of the gamification of transit and providing incentives for uh, multi-ride passes and repeats passengers, as well as reloadable fare cards, things like that. 
Um, so we're not just attracting those writers who are writing out of necessity, but we're also attracting the writers who um, have options. I'm sorry that I was late, but um, do you know what the transit committee will be voting on um, this proposal? Yes, the public transit committee uh, did approve this, uh, this proposal and we anticipate it being on the June 15th commission for formal adoption. And what recommendation for a fare increase did they um, support? At this time, it did not specify a fare increase, uh, but rather we'll come back to that with the PTC and begin having those discussions once the master plan has been formally adopted. Mallory, would you be opposed to having a fare increase over a certain number of years, like a three-year period of time? instead of an immediate increase? So th there's, there's pluses and minuses to that. Um, number one, it can feel like multiple increases. So even though it's kind of passed as one increase, um, when we step it or transition it over multiple years, it can feel like multiple increases to passengers rather than just one. And also the expense of, of that increase. So it isn't as simple as just flipping a switch and saying, uh, you know, now the fare is going to be $1.75 tomorrow. We have to have our fare box company reprogram our fare collection. Um, so now the machine needs to recognize $1.75 as a paid fare. We would need to have um, our system recognize the different reduced fares and calculate our charges differently. So there's computer programming that goes in on the backside of what that looks like, as well as all of our materials that would need to be updated to include that fare. So um, Although that may ease the transition into a higher fare, it comes at a higher expense as well to implement, if that makes sense. So you're speaking from experience more than anything else on the recommendation. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory. Um, I was... Um, so maybe surprised, maybe not, I'm not sure about the number of people who actually use it daily for work. And that when you do the math, it's almost a car payment, right? So there's, you know, $7 each way, um, five days a week. And I'm curious if, um, if a fair increase is going, have you had a chance to talk to those frequent um, riders who are using it for work and, and get their thoughts on what this might mean for them? Yes, so uh, last March when we were at this point, our proposal was to um, raise our fixed route fare from $1.25 to $1.75 and um, keep our reduced fare in line with that uh, increase as well. However, we were not going to change that $7 fare. So um, we were not gonna change the $5 fare either. The fare we were gonna change is the $2 uh, reduced fare, ADA reduced fare on teletransit and take that from $2 to $3. So we did have uh, several opportunities for public comment. Um, we were surprised that many of our writers were supportive of this, uh, had realized that it had been a, a very long time, but we did hear from, from people throughout the community who talked about what this meant to them um, and how just even you know an extra 50 cents a day or a dollar a day was going to impact them. Um, it did make us look at what those fair multi-ride passes looked like. And so the benefit to purchasing a multi-ride pass kind of eased that burden of what that fare increase looked like. Thank you. You're welcome. One of the interesting statistics you talked about uh, car payment, it being almost a car payment. Um, and so APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, um, always shares the statistic that I, I love, um, that it, it costs the average person about $10,000 a year to own a car. Um, that is your car payment, car maintenance, car insurance, fuel, and public transportation costs less than half of that. So for people who, are using this every day as their means of transportation, it is 
it is a difference and we get that, but it still is uh, providing them that kind of relief from that burden of owning a car if they choose not to. Mallory, I'll say that um, your efficiencies and upgrades um, make it a little less cumbersome on the increase. And especially going back to 2003 for our actual last increase that we've had. Um, how quickly are you gonna be able to implement some of these changes uh, such as better bus shelters and uh, stop areas? So great questions. And it's kind of, I'm gonna say a threefold answer. So that was one of the important things the PTC, the outgoing PTC had talked about when we were discussing that fare increase, um, especially when we were comparing ourselves to other cities. And well, what are, what are our amenities compared to those other cities amenities? And what are people getting for their, the, you know, bang for your buck? So with our recent capital grants that we've received that will allow us to kind of bring our system up to par and bring our system more in line with what those other systems look like. So we'll have newer vehicles, we'll have more appealing shelters and things like that. But as you alluded to, it's, it's not an easy process and it's not gonna happen overnight. So even though we received a grant for you know, 14 new buses, that is gonna be easily five years before our entire fleet is replaced. And part of that is strategic. And part of that is just the length of time that it takes to execute a grant and write the, uh, you know, there isn't necessarily a bus dealership that we can just go drive a vehicle off the lot. So we're from the time we get a successful um, solicitation written that has all of the specs of what we're looking for for a vehicle here in Battle Creek, um, we get that bid out and then the bus gets built. You're looking at roughly an 18 month to two year process before the first bus is even delivered. So we know that that's gonna, that's gonna require some patience from the community, but in the end, we'll have a, a system that has buses that are no older than seven years old at that point, and we'll have shelters that are brand new. So we anticipate the shelters being able to be kind of installed over the next year or two, um, beginning next year, and then our buses should begin rolling in after that. Speaking of those shelters, um, I, I'm trying to recall, I believe in one of our commission workshops around the roundabout, there were some monies that um, when the roundabout was not uh, adopted, that could possibly be shifted over to public transit to help with shelters. Is that something that occurred? It is. So um, we worked closely with Carl and his team uh, after the roundabout vote. Uh, so that the city was didn't lose that money and we were able to obligate that money for transit. So we've been working closely with BCATS, the local MPO, as well as MDOT to get that money flexed from federal highways over to federal transit administration so that we can use that for um, bus shelters. We have some environmental work to do and some additional documentation to provide to the feds um, to justify those projects. But ultimately, we do expect that that it's roughly 250, uh, almost $300,000 with the state match that comes with it um, to purchase bus shelters. And so that will be to essentially help us implement part of this master plan. And those bus shelters using that CMAC money, the congestion mitigation money, um, using that funding, we have to show an increase in ridership. So that's where we're tying in our master plan goals and building our shelters along some of those proposed route changes that are anticipated to increase ridership. Fantastic, thank you. And I guess another question, so uh, our mayor had asked specifically about um, increasing some ridership and you had talked a little bit about an initiative. Are there any um, upcoming initiatives to introduce maybe new people or, um, to bring some awareness around ridership? Yes, um, so also part of the congestion mitigation, we have some marketing and outreach funding to help promote the use of public transit and, and shift away from single occupancy vehicle. Um, and we also have a clean commute week coming up. So the week of June 14th, 
we're going to be celebrating clean commute. We have incentives and prizes for the passengers who um, use public transportation. And then for the passenger who commutes, clean commutes the most that week, we'll have kind of a grand prize. But so through social media and uh, through the city's page, we plan on promoting different ways that you can reduce your carbon footprint, not only through public transit, but through ride sharing, bike sharing, and walking. Great, thank you. Thank you. Mallory, I'm gonna support your proposal uh, and your recommendation just because I've witnessed some real positive changes that have taken place in Battle Creek Transit. I know this is gonna be a difficult one for the commission to vote on, but I think we've gotta move forward. Um, we're in a very lucky position right now with the grant dollars that you're speaking about. I think you've worked very hard at achieving those. And um, I think we wanna move forward with Battle Creek Transit. And I think this is a positive. Um, I know that the fare box totals do not uh, substantiate or provide that much money to our general fund budget. Um, we'll probably lose a few passengers, but at the same time, I think we're being um, proactive and progressive in your decision that you're recommending. So I just wanna let you know that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I do think this is a great opportunity for Battle Creek Transit. I think our last few years, we've been able to show that we are looking for every alternative we can. We're, we're tapping into every resource we can, and we're trying to braid as many funding sources as we can so that we can improve the options that we have in the city and that we have more options available, not just for public transit, but for mobility in general. Thank you. I agree with the mayor. Thank you for, for stating that so succinctly. It, it has been a, a great process and um, Foursquare was very professional, um, went above and beyond in, in surveying our public, um, actually getting on buses and asking riders their opinion on these things. Um, it, it, it's been a while since they did this process, but when they did it, it was very, very thorough. Um, so I'm, I'm more than ready to move on with this. I think this is maybe uh, my, the fourth time that I've, I've had a, a meeting that's been based on this, having been on the, on the transportation committee. And I wholeheartedly agree with, with Ms. Avis's um, recommendation. Um, I think it'll do a lot for the city of Battle Creek. And I do see a lot of potential ridership along with this. Um, as mentioned, um, adding new stops that are based um, at apartment complexes, I think could help us a lot. Um, and, and just changing the route so that it is more accessible um, so that um, more people can physically get on and off of the buses is, is a big thing. Um, not having the ADA bus stops, I think is a real detriment to our city. Uh, Commissioner Sophia, do you have any questions or comments? It's not. I appreciate you asking. I, I would support those comments made by the mayor, the vice mayor, Commissioner Blood. Um, I, you have done a fantastic job, Mallory. I appreciate all the, the work that's gone into this and um, I, it will be um, it will be difficult for some people, but I, I mean, not having a fair, there is nothing that I can think of that is, that costs the same as it did 20 years ago. There's, it just, it's not out there. So thank you for, for all of the work you've done. Commissioner Morris, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, I don't have any questions. My only comment would be that I too am in support um, of this and I appreciate Mallory and all of the work that she's put into this. This is my second time uh, seeing this presentation and she did very well both times. I can say that she carried it off the same way and I made sure that I got a lot of information from that. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments by the commission before we move on to public comment? Oh, we have Commissioner Herring is back. Commissioner Herring, would you have any questions or comments? Uh, 
Hi, everyone. Um, yeah. Yes, I agree. There's a lot. Of it. It's not the same. It's definitely not the same as what it used to cost. I think if a, a small increase can help, I'm all for it. Laura, you've done a great, you and your team have done a great job. So I just appreciate the hard work. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll go ahead and move on then to public comment, if that's all right with any, is everybody ready for that? Okay, I'm seeing lots of heads nodding. <laughs> we'll go ahead and move on to public comment. So if you are in our virtual waiting room, um, wait to be called upon. And then um, when that happens, you'll want to um, unmute yourself by pressing star six. Um, Sarah, do we have anyone at this time? Mm -hmm. that Make we do not, Vice Mayor Ferris. We're all set. Okay, then. Well, seeing no more commission comment or any public comment, that brings us to the end of the meeting. If no one else has anything to add, um, we will be back at seven tonight with our regularly scheduled commission meeting. Vice, Thank Vice, you, Mallory. Yeah, <laughs> but Vice Mayor, just quickly before yeah. we sign off, mm -hmm. um, I, I, just a quick um, note to the commission that. We do expect to bring formal adoption of the transit master plan to the commission at this meeting on the 15th. But as Mallory indicated earlier, that will not include a fair increase at that time. So just wanted to make sure that we were clear of that. So that will be something that would be brought for the commission's consideration a little bit later on. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. All right, then everyone, thank you for your attendance and I'll see you later tonight at seven. Bye-bye.